Yeah, I'll be honest, I'm surprised by this one too. But after finishing slogging through this boring slug fest, I was I actually sat down and started recording. And I was in mid-sentence when I realized that, well, by my own definitions, there's one off, which is a really bad episode. Two off, which is a bad episode. And then Lamentation, which is a really bad episode with, like, that little extra oomph. So, anyways, <clears throat> the garden, the apple, the whatever. If you asked me yesterday which episode this was, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Point in fact. Obviously, I read up on this stuff before I go into the episodes, and I pulled up a picture of the episode, and you'd be like, which one is this one? And I saw the big picture of Val. That is to say, the cave entrance. They don't actually show the computer or machine or whatever it is at any point in the episode. There's just, it's just this cave thing. So it's just like, okay. Um, cool, cool. I'm, I'm with it. What episode is this? It's the first episode that doesn't have a wig for Chekhov. It's an episode written by Max Ehrlich, who has never written another episode of Trek ever. Thank God. Why does Starfleet keep insisting on making contact even when they are otherwise unwelcome? My orders are to explore this area and make contact no matter what. And Kirk's big arc is how much he regrets himself, how much he doubts himself. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I followed orders. How could I? I should have left at the first sign of trouble. And it's just... I don't buy a millisecond of it. Oh, and then a guy gets hit by darts, so he's dead. A red shirt gets hit by darts. So then they decide to stick around and walk around and find some of this. And they find these rocks that explode. That's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. Spock is killed. No one believes that for a millisecond, of course. And this is when we find out that the ship is dampened, the transporters aren't working, and we see a fairly typical escalation of problems. It's worth noting that, as of this point, I have about four notes in my, my notes here. And we're at about the 11-minute mark. Not a good sign. Then, a red shirt gets hit by lightning. Then... A red shirt dies to a rock. You know, what's funny is I'd say this is the most red shirts dying in an episode, but actually, if you're remembering, with the changeling, which I think was just the previous episode, we had four red shirts die in very short succession. We're only up to three so far. So, once again, we have orbit issues. Okay. And they have this thing, you know the da 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 music? Actually, that's the wrong music. That's It's the... It's the dun 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 music. Da, wow, you know the one. It's the one I make fun of pretty much every time I do dun dun dun. It's from TOS. It happens twice in this episode before, uh, once before a commercial break and once not. Yeah, I um, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what to add to this. It really pulls me out of an already bad episode. Now I'm not going to pick on the effects. Actually, the effects are not bad. And remember, they've got that one set problem. In this case, it's actually two sets, but still. They were trying very hard to make that work. And they used a lot of weird camera angles and a lot of looking down in order to try and make it look larger than it was. And I'm going to let that slide. I'm maybe going to let slide the Oompa Loompas that are in this episode. No, what, what irritates me is that everything else about the episode is also bad. They have this super mega paradise world, which is being maintained by some computer, which has been here for 10,000 years, built by not answered. I'm just going to say it was Landru, because this is exactly what happened in Return of the Archons. In fact, there's a scene in this episode where Kirk and Spock argue that they need to interfere in order to save these people. Kirk, Spock actually flat out brings up, and I wrote it down, our non-interference directive is what he calls it this time. He flat out admits that. Thanks to our non-interference directive, we should not interfere with these. It is then Kirk who argues well, this is a stagnant culture, and because of its stagnation, we should interfere, because it's not developing. Now, in Return of the Archon, Spock was like, okay, and went along with that. Here, apparently, he's had, he's had some time to mull that over, because he argues this for a while, up to and including after they have already successfully defeated the machine that's running the society. If you could call one tiny town on an entire planet a society. Ahem. <sighs> yeah. There's, I, I mean, we've got the fact that they're kids, you know, the, the, the undeveloped people. We've got the fact that um, they need to re drain the mana, the power source of the godlike entity. We've got the, the machine which is maintaining a stagnant society. 
this is just a jigsaw hodgepodge of episodes we've already have. And it's not a particularly good one at that. This then leads to a really weird, awkward scene. So, uh, Yeoman, I looked her name up, by the way. Yeoman, what's her face? I'm not going to say her name because it doesn't matter. Never shows up ever again. Now, that's important because she and Chekhov are certainly getting very close over there in the background. I like to think that what happened was they got very close, and then she realized, wait a second, if I actually get together with Chekhov, I'm going to have to terminate my career because for some frickin' reason that's how it works in Starfleet in this era. So she decided to break it off with poor Chekhov. This, of course, led to him deciding to rebel against Kirk in the Mirror Universe because that happened in the Mirror Universe too. Look, shut up. I'm, I'm just making stuff up at this point. I don't know, dude. Oh, my God, this is just so blah. So, I mean, Chekhov and, and random lady... Macking on each other. Whatever. Like, I don't really have a strong opinion on that, other than the fact that I was wondering why the episode devotes three solid minutes, three solid minutes, to them being like, nom, nom, nom. And then the locals trying very slowly and awkwardly to mimic it. It is pleasant. Oh, my gosh. And the whole time I'm sitting here thinking, why is this in this episode? Well, it turns out there's an actual purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, touching? is forbidden. And the mere fact that they are now doing this thing that was forbidden to them is now cause for Val to state that they are poisonous creatures and must be killed immediately. Yes, I get the ridiculously obvious reference to the Garden of Eden and the fact that the episode is named the Apple and the fact that they flat out admit that they are basically playing the role of Satan said word for word in the role of this story. Who could possibly look like Satan in our party? Standing at Spock. And they're the ones that gave the apple. I could even mention how there's some parallels with certain aspects and types of this story, depending on which version of the story you prefer to listen to. This is... I mean, there's symbolism, and then there's just doing it. Being blunt can work, and depending on the circumstances. And then sometimes it can very not work. Exhibit A. So they have this really long scene, which then shows them what disobedience is, and thus their great creator machine must kick them out of the Garden of Eden and force them to be able to cook and make things on their own. Question. This planet is filled with horrific, deadly nightmares. Were those all being maintained by Vol? There are explosive rocks on this planet, and super death uh, plants with the little needle shooting thing. Unless those are all maintained by fall, these people are going to die very quickly and in very short order. Especially since they are told basically to just kind of figure it out for themselves. You remember what happened in Return of the Archons? At the end, they left some people behind. You remember that, right? In order to help them acclimate to having a society. And you know what they do here? Well, <laughs> you got this. Peace! And then they leave. If you remember, back in Return of the Archons, I had a whole speech about the Prime Directive and the Prime Directive of Non-Interference, which I'm distinguishing those two now, and how if you're going to interfere, do it right, was one of the main points I was trying to make there. This is how you do it wrong. This is like rising up against an evil empire, killing the emperor, and then leaving the planet. All you've done is create a massive power gap and a, this huge structural hole in the society which is going to cause chaos and death and possibly just the dissolution of said society. I'm telling you, these people are going to be extinct inside of a decade at the absolute outside. Probably within a year. <sighs> I... So then they're told how to kill. Because, sure, why not? And the, the ship's there and it's going to go die. Oh, oh, and then... Another red shirt gets killed. We're up to four now. Clubbed to death. That's that's cool. Uh, being clubbed to death is awesome. It does. I, I will give the episode this one and only one credit. It makes sense that they suck at the fight, despite the fact that they have superior numbers, because they have no idea what fighting is. They were the one of them was instructed in how to kill by using a club on a melon, and then all the others just kind of aped that action. So yeah, no, it it makes perfect sense that they have no idea what they're doing whatsoever. They're basically children trying to chase after the target, which they perceive as the heads, because it never occurred to them that they could fight any other way, Why? right? Why would they? They've never done this before. Ugh. So then they steal the ship's ma mana. They even use the phaser banks to hit the temple. Is this straight out of Who Mourns for Adonais? Ugh. And then, 
The episode ends on not one, but two want wahs in a row. Now, I don't like want wahs in general. I suppose this is a good time as any to discuss a want wah, um, because I don't think I've actually mentioned that in this particular series so far, even though TOS is so prolific with it. The term comes, it's W-A-H, W-A-H. It's for the, the, like the horn, like the trombone or wah, wah. And that should probably explain it for most of you, but for the, for the off chance you don't get it, it's when an episode ends on like a oh you or <laughs> or some kind of attempt to terminate the episode on basically a joke. Usually a bad joke. And usually a bad joke that is followed with fake laughter. To be clear, in order for it to be a wah-wah, it specifically has to be awkward or unfunny or cringy or some, some other problem, right? It's a problem that has arisen so much in fiction, especially in sitcoms, because a lot of writers don't know how to end certain scripts. This is actually one thing I will totally give more modern Trek stuff, including Enterprise, where they don't need a wah-wah in order, to, in order to end a script, in order to signify that the episode is over. They can just end it in a natural way that makes sense, either in the middle of events or with some kind of coda. Voyager was very fond of codas, which actually I rather liked on Voyager, where they would sit and have some kind of scene that has something to do with the episode, or something to do with Seven, because in, in the later seasons it was all about Seven. I mean, I like Seven as a character. She's probably one of my favorite characters on that show, but damn it, come on. Not every episode has to have Seven learn a lesson about humanity. Come on. Anyways, the point is, there are plenty of ways to end an episode, and a Wawa is, in my opinion, the worst possible way to end an episode. I would actually take an abrupt cessation, um, like in the infamous one in Sopranos, over a Wawa. So in this case, the two want wahs we have are down on the planet. Eh, you, you'll you'll figure it out. It's this whole kid thing. I think you're already on your way. Sex is gonna be great. I'm sure you guys can't wait. The second one, the second problem here, the second want wah is when they t do the oh look, we're totally Satan, and look, Spock is totally Satan. Isn't that funny? Now, I know they were poking fun at some of the people who were saying that Spock was designed in such a way because of having the incredibly evil act of having pointed ears. I know, it's it's just this knife ears. <laughs> Star Trek predicted Dragon Age. I knew it! I can think of nothing redeeming about this episode. The guest stars aren't interesting. The plot is blah. And a mishmash of other better executions. I didn't even like Return of the Archons. It's actually on my skip list. It's still substantially better than this episode. There was at least some legitimately cool stuff in there, right? That definitely pulled it up from what otherwise might have been consideration for Lamentation. And this episode just kind of... It grates on me. You know what I mean? If I could just drop all attempts at levity for a second. It really grates on me in a way that I don't even know how to properly describe. I Real talk, okay? A little historical fact. In the middle of this episode... Uh, Lore Reloaded did a fake thing where he was like, I'm going to totally pretend that I'm the Lore Runner and, and do a riff on me. And I was so from going through this episode, I paused the episode in the middle of it and went and came up with and recorded and then uploaded on the fly just a you know a joke, basically a joke about me riffing on his show because we're friends and we can do that. That's, that's what friends do. I'm going to laugh if by the time this video goes live we are no longer friends, because this is going to be over a year and a half from now at this point. But anyways, I was so in, more engaged in doing this random 40-second video than I was watching this episode, because it was just... It was just ugh. I've noticed with some of the really bad ones, this, this is another thing that kind of contributes to lamentation status, if I feel the legitimate need to pause in the middle of it just to take a mental breather because of how much it's just pulling me, that's probably a sign I need to at least put it in consideration for Lamentation. And, and I just wanted to share that little story with you, because this is already going to be a short video. I, I don't have much to discuss. Is This is the... I, I've already joked about, you know, we've already had the Shades of Grey. No, this is the Shades of Grey of TOS. It is a bad mishmash of other episodes with no thought or creativity put into it. There is nothing good I can say about this episode. Ladies and gentlemen, if my calculations are correct, which they probably are, this is the last episode of 2021. Which means this is the last episode I'm recurring during this particular floodgate cycle. I'm double-checking really quick. Yep, the Apple. This should be the 27th of December right now. 
What an episode to end my recording in 2020 on. You know? <laughs> just so appropriate that the, the just the dumpster fire that has been 2020 has has the the final send off for TOS for it is the freaking apple that is so appropriate guys i hope you've been enjoying this TOS so, stuff so far despite my complaining looking at my list here the goods absolutely outweigh the bads there's been some phenomenal stuff here it's been really fascinating digging into it and the creation of it and learning about all this stuff. There's actually a few names I wasn't even aware of that I'm learning more about their contributions to Trek, which has just been an awesome experience. I hope it's been awesome for you guys, too. See you next year.